patients who are prescribed radiation therapies go through the process. Once the decision has been made by the radiation oncologist and the patient that they are to undergo radiation therapy treatments, the first part of that procedure is simulation. A simulation means that the patient is going to, uh, is going to undergo a CT-based scan. Okay. These CT uh, machines that are, are in the radiation oncology department are a little different than your conventional CT in that they can create 3D images. They can they, they have what we call a DRR, digitally reconstructed uh, radiographs which allows us to convert them into 3D images so that the radiation oncologist, he or she can look at it 3D. And that's important because they need to determine what volume is going to be irradiated. So all patients are going to undergo some type of 3D simulation, which is different from the planning technique that we are expected to code. So anytime you see 3D simulation, Please ignore that as far as coding. Don't let that throw you off. What my eyes immediately lock into is that IMRT technique. Okay. But there are ways to confirm this if you have access to the radiation oncology database. The most common ones are ARIA and Mosaic. If you have any of those, I urge you to become familiar with that because a lot of us are going to be faced with uh, se uh, clinical scenarios or treatment summaries that are lacking in detail, lacking in information that we need to code that case correctly. So we need to take it a step further. If we cannot get on the phone and contact the radiation oncologist or the dosimetrist or the radiation therapist, but we do have access to, the, to their um, software application, then we can go in there. Okay, so this is what I did in this case. So, okay, so I know, okay, IMRT, good indication, but let's see confirmation of that in the software. So again, back to that critical question, what equipment was used to deliver that treatment? This is information that you can find in a mosaic or area for this, for, for any and every patient that is going to receive external beam radiotherapy, radiation therapy. The blue arrows give you information on the planning technique. I added a couple more since, uh, since I put these together for you. So blue, again, the planning technique. The red, the modality code, which that one is an easy one because you know that, as I mentioned this morning, if you see 10X or 10NV or 10NVX, that refers to photon. That's telling me that it was photons and that the equipment that delivered the photon therapy is a linear accelerator or a LINAC, okay? And here it tells me that it was a variant, a variant linear accelerator. Now let's look at the blue arrows. Here we have ARC, okay? That's ARC therapy. That's rotational therapy. The moment you see, I can stop right here as far as, as, far as my planning technique. The moment I see ARC therapy, I know it's, it's an IMRT plan, okay? But I, if you want further confirmation, gantry direction, uh, you have to go back to your slides and see what the gantry is. That's that big portion of the machine. If the patient is supine on the table and, yeah, and I have the gantry at zero degrees, it's right in front of the patient's over the patient's head, okay? That's the gantry. We can, I can rotate that. Remember I said 180 degrees in either direction. So the gantry rotation information here is telling me in which direction the gantry is going to be rotated for the first field of treatment, okay? CW, the, the gantry is rotating in a counterwise direction, okay? Counterclockwise because it's rotational therapy, so, sorry, clockwise rotation. 
This is counterclockwise rotation. Both of them are indicative of R therapy equivalent to IMRT. And finally, uh, even here as well, we see VMAT. VMAT stands for volumetric modulated arc, and I repeat, arc therapy. Again, arc, sorry for being repetitive, but arc equals rotation, rotational therapy equals IMRT at minimum. Okay, so I have plenty of confirmation that this plan was indeed IMRT and plenty of confirmation here and in the initial summary that the modality code should be 02. Back to the original uh, treatment summary, okay. 10X photon immediately, modality code 02, 6X photon for this phase as well. So the beam energy tells us that it was a linear accelerator and the photons were used. <clears throat> what else can we find in ARIA or Mosaic? You have access to the images that were used by the radiation oncologist to plan the treatment. Okay? Every radiation oncologist looks at these images and identify the primary tumor volume, first of all, and adjacent structures that may be at risk of getting exposed to radiation therapy in the, in, in the process of treating the primary tumor volume. <clears throat> in addition to that, the radiation oncologist will contour, and that's what we call these lines, they will draw these contours along the regions that they also want to irradiate. So I've given you two examples here. This example clearly shows that the bladder has been contoured. So the bladder is going to be irradiated. In this example as well, we see this has been contoured on both sides. These are the regional lymphatics, okay? So if you see this image, Goes, that goes along with your patient and that treatment summary, this is confirmation that the regional lymph nodes are going to be irradiated. Okay. This is critical structure that we try to avoid. Here's another example of a bladder case okay. <clears throat> image, okay. not necessarily pertaining to our patient. But you can see the difference here. The patient, the bladder is, is a contour. Okay. There is always going to be regions outside of the bladder that are going to be exposed to radiation, but we try to minimize that. Okay. That's the complex part of planning radiation therapy treatments because photons are so penetrating that they actually pen go right through the patient. Some of them go right through the patient, outside the patient, and if we didn't have shielding on those walls, they will go right through the wall and irradiate whoever's on the other side of that treatment room. Okay. So they're very penetrating. So you cannot avoid having some healthy tissue get some degree of radiation, but we always try to minimize the dose to healthy tissues, maximize the dose to the tumor or the tumor bed. But you can see in these pictures that we don't, see this being contour at all. So in this particular scenario, it's telling us that only the primary treatment volume or the primary organ site is being irradiated, not the lymphatics. So this is the type of information that if you have access to ARIA or, or mosaic, it will help you in determining the irradiated treatment volume for that particular patient. And this is true for all sites. So with the information that's given to us, there are two phases, okay? Phase one is the bladder and the pelvic lignos. They did mention the pelvis. So we have to code with that and that's a zero six. It is external beam radiotherapy. We have confirmed in multiple ways that it was IMRT and this was a total dose for this particular phase. Phase two, it was a boost. So the lymph nodes are not being irradiated. Remember, I repeated that multiple times this morning. Boost 
no lymph nodes being irradiated because it's a very small volume. Again, it is external beta therapy and it is an IMRT plan. So this one was pretty straightforward, two phases. And then because we are talking about the bladder and the bladder in both phases, we can add the dose from each of these phases to get your total dose summary of 6480. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so I was asked to cover uh, some cases uh, in the central nervous system. And here is one, uh, a GBM, a glioblastoma multiform. Uh, it's a bad player, okay? It's, it's one of the most aggressive types of cancer that, 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 that you'll ever see. That one with uh, pancreatic cancer, after all these decades, it's, it's still bad. So um, let's look at the radiation therapy uh, summary here. The prescribed uh, treatment is uh, chemotherapy <clears throat> and external beam radiation therapy. And here it's telling us that it was VMAP, okay? Now we know what VMAP is. Volumetric modulated arc, and I repeat arc, rotational therapy. As soon as you see the arc therapy, rotational therapy, equated with IMRT, okay? <clears throat> And when it's presented to you this way, okay, it, it mentions a, a cone down boost. It's telling you that the volume has changed. Okay? You have a large volume and a smaller volume. And both of them are irradiating the brain. 6X tells you that it's photons. So my modality code is gonna be 02, external beam photons. My planning technique is going to be IMRT. Back to the images that you, hopefully, a lot of you have access to in Mosaic or Aria. How do we interpret this? And what, what kind of information can we gather from these images? Well, of course, if you're not familiar with this, it can be totally confusing. But let me try to simplify so that it will be helpful to you. One thing I want to point out, look at this. This line, this is an arc. And remember what I said about arc? Rotational therapy. This confirms that this plan is an IMRT plan. Anytime you see this, that's rotational therapy. That's something that you can, that's something concrete that you can get from these images. The second useful information that you can get here is the treatment volume. Notice, uh, first of all, what the, let me just go back to the prescribed dose for a second. <clears throat> 6,000 centigrade, okay? And the reason for that is here is 6,000 centigrade and it's color coded yellow. So this is your plan to more volume. This is what was being irradiated. And there was a volume, a smaller volume within the larger one that was boosted, okay? You add that all up and you get the 6,000 centigrade. My point here is as far as your primary treatment volume, the information that you can get from this is that you can clearly see in a visual representation that the partial brain is being irradiated, not the entire brain, okay? Partial brain, we have a code for that. So two bits of very useful information that you can extract from these images. Rotational therapy, IMRT, planning technique equals zero 05. And the planned tumor volume is gonna be, uh, or the irradiated tumor volume is gonna be the partial brain. Another image on, uh, on, on this patient. And again, you see that arc. This is the extent of the rotation of the gantry from a linear accelerator. A starting point here, and it rotates all the way to this point. While the machine or the gantry is rotating, it is irradiating this volume, okay? That's what this means. This is the extent of the rotation. 
And again, you can see that only the partial brain is being irradiated, yellow indicative of the prescribed dose of 6,000 centigrade. And again, outside of that plant tumor volume, there is going to be some tissue that will be exposed to radiation. And that's what these uh, contours indicate, but smaller amounts of radiation. Additional information that we can get from these, from area or mosaic, you, you might see something like this. And again, we know when we see 6X, that's the planning modality, zero two photons, very easy. But look at the gantry. The gantry is information is telling you that there is a counterclockwise rotation from 340 degrees to 181 degrees for this field. For this other field, there's a clockwise rotation from 181 to 340. Point is, you're talking about R therapy, rotational therapy, which is VMAT equals to IMRT. This is additional confirmation that we can code it to 05 IMRT. And that's what we have done here. You're gonna select brain limited. We saw the, uh, the graphic images that show you that it was only partial brain, not the whole brain. And there's no draining, draining lymph nodes in the brain, so there should be zero. We have the beam energy, and that tells you that it's zero two. We confirm that it was rotational therapy, VMAT equivalent to uh, IMRT. Okay. <clears throat> and both of them, both faces, uh, treated the brain. So we can safely add this, uh, the 4,600 to the 1,400 to get the total dose summary of 6,000. Another GBM case <clears throat> here is telling us that it was a uh, partial brain irradiation. Okay, now we know this is photon, zero two. We can easily get that out of the way. Um, what is not telling us here anywhere is what the uh, planning technique is. Okay. But I have access to the images. And right away, I see this rotational therapy. Okay. And I also see that a limited volume in, in, the, in the brain was irradiated. So I have clear information on how to code this. My planning technique is gonna be IMRT. And just to give you the heads up, when we irradiate a primary tumor volume, not a metastatic, but a primary tumor volume in, in the CNS or the brain, you should expect to see IMRT planning technique used. And these two examples uh, give us confirmation of that. And another view, and you see the extent of the rotation of the arc therapy in this case, IMRT, and you see the irradiated volume as well. So this was a single, a single phase to a total dose of 6,000 centigrade. Okay. We can use multiple fields to treat one site. And just because we use multiple fields, it doesn't mean that they are multiple phases, okay? When we treat the breast cancer, for example, if we treat it uh, uh, using the breast tangent technique, typically we use two fields, but it's a single phase. <clears throat> so here's a case with, uh, this, this question was submitted to me by a CTR some time ago, but it's a good um, educational opportunity here. So the patient has a lung primary with brain meds and the patient presented for a gamma knife to the CNS metastatic sites, okay? Notice it's plural, multiple lesions. Unfortunately, in some cases when the, um, when the cancer spreads to the brain, it's, in some cases it's going to be multiple lesions uh, found in the brain. And 
it was uh, there was a range of doses given to these multiple CNS lesions, and they ranged from 16 to 18 grays. This is what you should expect to see 16 or even 20 gray range when gamma knife is used for treatment of metastatic brain disease. Okay. This was a stage four. This is all coming from the, from the CTR that submitted this question. Okay. And I just highlighted this. The energy was a cobalt 60 unit. Okay. That's what a gamma knife is. A gamma knife actually has a live source within the equipment. Cobalt 60 emits um, gamma radiation. That's what we call it gamma. But for our purposes, equate gamma with photons. So the planning technique, whenever you see the gamma radiation should be zero to photon, external beam photons, okay? <clears throat> Patient was uh, irradiated with a single fraction and this was the dose range. So there were multiple lesions that were irradiated with uh, the gamma knife. Again, this information came from that CTR. Uh, he or she had access to ARIA or Mosaic and they did a print screen of this. And this can be so confusing, but let me simplify for you. First of all, a gamma knife unit, let me get a uh, jump ahead here. Here is a gamma knife uh, machine, okay? This is still external beam radiation therapy, okay? It is used for the, typically it is used for the treatment of metastatic CNS lesions in the brain. Okay? It can target multiple, multiple uh, lesions at once. And when I say multiple, don't be surprised if you ever run into a case where the patient was irradiated with a gamma knife and they treated 10, 12 metastatic sites in the brain in a single session, okay? It is, that is not unusual. That's, that's the uh, uniqueness of this machine. It has something, um, the way that it's structured, it has beamlets that emanate from that equipment in excess of 120, 120 beamlets that can be targeted to the brain in a patient. So uh, each beamlet is composed of gamma knife or gamma radiation. And those beamless is what they refer to as shots. Okay. So all of these sites, notice how many targets were on this patient. All of these sites receive a certain number of beamlets or of gamma radiation. 31 shots on that one, four on that one, six on this one. Okay. Multiple sites that were targeted at once on that patient. That patient sat on that machine for however many, uh, many minutes and all those sites were treated at once. Okay. Key thing here is it's a single phase, whether it's three lesions or 15 lesions, it's a single phase because it's done in a single session. That patient is not coming back for that, for those lesions tomorrow or the next day, unless there is recurrence or new lesions that pop up. Secondly, because let's say that, um, no, let's go back to this patient. You have seven lesions that are being irradiated in this range. You're always going to choose the highest dose. And that's what you're going to code in your abstract. So two things, it's still the modality code is going to be zero two. The planning technique, we have a, a code for gamma knife, specifically for gamma knife. So if you look at the store, it will tell you right off the bat. So it is a single session and the highest dose delivered to this patient was 1800 centigrade or 18 grays. And code eight is what we have specifically for stereotactic radiosurgery or gamma knife. 
And that's what we should be using. So again, I reiterate that when a gamma knife is used, you're most likely to see multiple lesions in the brain being irradiated in a single session. Don't let that confuse you. That's a single session. Equate that with a single phase and code it to the highest dose that was used to treat any of the lesions. Craniospinal axis irradiation. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Wilson. We no have problem. a question, sure. sorry to break this up. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a question asking, would you please repost or at least clarify again from this morning session regarding APPA 01 planning versus 04 if CT sim? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So unfortunately, when the APPA is used, my, <clears throat> my experience has been that the treatment summary does not give us that information. It doesn't give us the planning technique that was used for that particular case. And if we have no access to all of these sources that I'm, 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 uh, I'm addressing on this afternoon section, then if you cannot confirm that it was 2D or 4D, then yes, I will code it to zero one, okay? But if you can find out if that patient underwent a three a, a simulation, just a simulation, okay? Because all simulations are three D. If they went underwent a simulation, then that's indicative that for that particular patient, for that APPA treatment, that patient um, they they came up with a three D conformal plan. Okay, but in the absence or in, 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 in the absence of that information, if we don't know that that patient underwent a CT simulation planning process, then we are only left with zero one as an option. <clears throat> okay, but if the treatment summary tells you that it was open fields, that's enough information to code it to zero two. All right, the cranial spinal axis for radiation therapists, this is one of the most difficult um, setups there is. Um, not only technically, but also in terms of um, that in, in terms of what the consequence is if we don't get this right. Okay. So let's look at the particulars of this case. So this is, and for, for <clears throat> cranial spinal axis irradiation is typically for these uh, ependymomas, which incidence rates are generally for young people, for kids, unfortunately. Okay. So this is a 17 year old female. She already has some surgery and now is undergoing proton beam therapy. Okay. This, is, this was a question that was submitted to me as well. <clears throat> and what they wanna know is how many phases, what is your treatment volume and what is the planning technique? I mean, those are the key things that, that we need to try to figure out in order to move forward with, with the code in these cases. I hope you don't encounter too many of these cases because they, well, for us, it's difficult to uh, set them up. And for you, since you're not gonna see them very often, you know, without practice, you're gonna be back to square one. <clears throat> And this is the information that was given to me also with the question. Okay. The volume, site name, and start, and then date, and so forth. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to try to simplify this for you by saying that when we use the cranial spinal axis technique, we are focusing, in most cases, on three sites, three sites only, okay? 
One is going to be the cranium. Second one is going to be the upper spine. And the third one is going to be the lower spine. We have to irradiate the entire central nervous system. As you know, that includes the brain and the spinal cord to the end of the spinal cord. And that's what we're seeing here. The central nervous system in the brain within the cranium, the central nervous system within the, uh, the spine, in the upper spine, and then in the lower spine, okay? And I will explain why they break it down into these in a second. It is one of the most complex radiation therapy techniques, okay? Because we have to match three totally different fields because we have to treat, there are limitations to the machine. The maximum field size that we can treat with uh, a LINAC or with a proton therapy, there is a limit to it. With a LINAC is 40 cm, 40 centimeters. I'm sure that with a proton unit, and I don't have experience with the proton unit, it's going to be somewhere in that range as well. There is a limit to it. But if you look at these images, the distance from here all the way to the inferior of, of the third field is a lot more than 40 cm. So we have to break these down into three separate fields. But notice how these um, beams diverge. They're not straightforward. So we have to make sure that the, the brain field also has this type of divergence where they meet because the risk here is that let's say that this region is um, prescribed 3000 centigrade and this region is also prescribed just for the sake of argument here, 3000 centigrade. If we don't match this carefully, there could be overlap in this region and the overlap could mean that all along this line, if we're not careful, we have contribution from this field, 3,000, and we have contribution from this field, an additional 3,000, 6,000 centigrade to the spine, to the spinal cord, will paralyze this patient. That's why it's such a complex and, and delicate procedure. Same thing with the other fields that have to be matched. Here's another match. It's easier when it's a straight line like this. And here, fortunately, this is the last field. The um, spinal cord extends all the way down here. So we have to treat the entire range of the spinal cord. That's what we're treating, the spinal cord here and the brain. That encompasses the central nervous system. And notice we have to be careful about the eye, okay? We have to compensate for that. Somehow we have to shield that. <clears throat> and here's the field for the, for the brain, okay? All we want to treat here is the brain and a portion of the spinal cord that can be encompassed here. We do not want to treat the lens of the eye. So this is indicative of a block to shield the lens of the eye. So let's simplify this treatment summary. Uh, it, it is proton therapy. So the unit of proton therapy is cobalt grade equivalent. And just to go back to what I said this morning, proton therapy is still considered external beam radiation therapy. So the code is for external beam, and we do have a code for that as well. Okay. <clears throat> the craniospinal axis, uh, uh, brain and the spine, okay. Here's your dose. And there is a boost to the, to the spine as well. 1800 centigrade. The challenge here is the volume. We really don't have anything in the store manual to capture all those different types of volume. So in cases like this, the only option we have left is um, the 98 other. As far as the radiation, the radiation to the drain, draining lymph nodes, it's such a large field that inevitably some of the lymph nodes in that large field are going to be irradiated, but that's not planned. 
that's incidental. When we have incidental irradiation to the lymph nodes, we do not count that. We still will code that to zero, zero, okay? And the code for the protons is zero, three. The planning technique is external beam uh, in. We don't have enough information to determine whether it's 3D. So the only option we have left in this case is external beam NOS. Okay. <clears throat> and these are the phases for this particular case. It, it is more, li more likely to be 3D, but we can make that assumption. Okay. Breast tangents. A couple of things I'm going to bring up with this case, um, with the breast tangent cases. The <clears throat> treatment summary, okay, things that we can immediately pick up on is the uh, modality code of zero two. In this case, the breast is irradiated to 50 grays, that's important. And the supraclav and the axilla are irradiated to 3850. This is very important to know that there is a difference in the fractionation. When there is a difference in fractionation, we have to treat these as separate phases. Ah, here they make it very clear. Both of them are 3D conformal. Okay, so that makes it easy for us, a code of zero four. But in addition to that, we have on FOS and mini tangents boost. And here is confirmation that this is electron therapy, 15E, E for electrons. And here's confirmation that the second portion of the boost is photon therapy. <clears throat> and you saw this slide early this morning. This is one of the first slides that I discussed. This is how I see the information. These are the items that jump out at me because they are the ones that are gonna help me code this correctly. But let's go back. I'm gonna cover a little bit about some of the terminology that is used here. Um, the savvy scout reflector localized lumpectomy. This can be confusing because there is actually a brachytherapy procedure that is also called savvy. Okay, so how do we distinguish between the two of them? Well, let me backtrack for a minute. A lot of patients that undergo breast surgery, lumpectomy specifically, they're gonna have a wire surgically inserted into the breast where one end of the wire is right where the tumor is located. The other end of the wire is actually protruding from the breast. So when the patient is brought to the OR, they have that wire in them sticking out. Okay, That's wire localization. It helps the surgeon locate the tumor at the time of surgery. Another approach that's used is this approach, this savvy scowl localizer reflector. And just for scale, it's a very small uh, device. This is also surgically inserted into the patient and it can be inserted a, a, a week in advance of the scheduled surgery. Much smaller, less intrusive, and there is a machine that is used to detect that at the time of surgery. So it will help guide the surgeon locate where the tumor is because that's where that seed is inserted into the patient. So those are two ways to use uh, localization uh, techniques in, in the OR. But this is the savvy, the scout uh, localizer. It's a seed that is inserted into the tumor bed. The other savvy is used with, uh, with radioactive seeds, high dose rate iridium 192 radioactive seeds that just happen to have the same abbreviation as the other savvy localizers. So don't get confused. Back to this clinical scenario. And this is the information that I can gather from the treatment summary. 10NV immediately tells me that a linear accelerator was used. In addition to that, it tells me that it is photons, zero two, okay? 
<clears throat> breast tangents also tells me that a linear accelerator is used. This is a gantry that I referred to before. And this is a typical setup position for breast cancer patients. They, we have to keep the arm out of the way because when the gantry is rotated, uh, we don't want the exit beam to go through the arm, just the breast alone. Okay. On FOS, when the patients are treated with a, a electron therapy, there is an attachment. These are called cones that are placed on the head of the gantry and they protrude way, way, way down. And the end of that instrument is brought as close to the patient's skin as possible. That's what this means, as close to the patient's skin on FOS. Okay? And on top of that, at the bottom of this cone, we have what we call an electron cutout, okay? The electron cutout has the shape of the irradiated volume that the radiation oncology wants to target, okay? So anytime we have an electron cutout, the additional information that we can gather from that is that this is also a 3D conformal plan, okay? Most, if not all, electron boosts for breast cancer patients are 3D conformal plans, but you might want to confirm that with your facility as well. Uh, one question you can ask them is, was there an electron cutout for that patient? Or was there a CT sim uh, or simulation? I'm used to just calling it sim, that's what we call it in the field, a CT sim or CT simulation. Either way, it will tell you that it was a 3D plan, okay? <clears throat> so this is a cone that I was pointing to right here, okay? And that's used for, um, for electron therapy. And at the bottom of that, you're gonna see that electron cut out, okay? So any time, and notice it, it has the shape of the volume that the physician wants to irradiate. Okay. So you have an electron cutout, that's 3D conformable. That means this patient actually underwent a CT simulation, 3D conformable plan. Bolus, I have had questions regarding bolus. Bolus is tissue equivalent material that is placed on top of the breast or the reconstructed breast as well. And what it does is the function is to bring the dose closer to the surface of the skin. Okay. This is very likely a reconstructed breast. And so the physician, the radiation oncologist wants to boost the surface of the skin. So they put bolus and that's what it does. It brings the dosage closer to the surface of the skin, but it has nothing to do with coding. So it's not associated with any planning technique. And hey, breast yep. Mr. Wilson, we yes. have another question for you, sir. Sure. All right. Oh, gosh, y'all forgive me for my nose. The question is, how many phases would be coded for brain lesions with different doses given in one fraction using cyber knife radio surgery? Ooh. Cyber knife. Okay. CyberKnife is a robotic-based linear accelerator. It is a linear accelerator. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's a 6NV linear accelerator. That's the only energy that the CyberKnife can treat. Okay. Um, that case is a little different from the gamma knife. If you look at the planning technique, the planning information in, in Mosaic or Aria, you're gonna find, I mean, I don't have that information for that particular case, but you're more likely going to find that each of those targets might have, may have their own separate plans. If that's the case, then you have to treat that as separate phases. If the lesions happen to be very close to each other, it's conceivable, it's possible that a single plan 
was sufficient to target them, but more likely than not, you might have several plants associated with each of those lesions. So in short, um, you, you're gonna need to, to um, verify that with your department. You're more likely to be talking about multiple phases in that case, as opposed to a gamma knife where a single session is equivalent to a single phase. So back to the breast tangents here, uh, just to give you an illustration of a whole breast irradiation and, uh, and the boost. So this is just a schematic, it's not exact as far as the border, but typically when we radiate the whole breast, this is it, okay, that's the whole breast. And when we're boosting something, it's gonna be a much smaller volume as you see here. And this could be, I mean, for this example, I put it there, but it could have been here, could have been in any other location. It all depends on where the lumpectomy was performed. Okay. But it's a much smaller volume. There's your lumpectomy boost. And again, it can be photons or electrons. And how do they determine whether to use photons or electrons? That depends on how deep that lesion is in the patient. If it's a deep lesion, you have to use something that's very penetrating, that's photons. If it's a more superficial lesion, then you're more likely to see electron boost being used. And in the planning images, this is what a breast tangent is gonna look like. Uh, and the tangents just refer to, the, to these oblique angles that are used uh, to treat the patient. It generally is used uh, as two fields. If you're treating the right breast, you're gonna be treating with uh, LAO, left anterior oblique, and then you're gonna rotate the gantry almost 180 degrees to the RPO, right posterior oblique. <clears throat> and then there's the prone technique. In, in this case, you're gonna be using lateral fields. And that's what the isodose distribution looks within the patient. This is another look at um, breast tangents, more likely a reconstructed breast post mastectomy. And that's our RAO, and this is an LPO. Okay, that's just the direction of the beam: right anterior oblique, left posterior oblique. Two fields to treat breast tangents, and just other looks. And when we talk about the supraclav, this is important. The supraclav, this is what it looks like. Okay, this is a, a typical appearance of the supraclav. We're treating the nose above the, the clavicle. Uh, and if we want to encompass more axillary lymph nodes, well, it's going to have a different shape. Again, these are all regional lymph nodes to the breast. And then there is the PAB, posterior axillary boost. Not many cases get a PAB boost, but if they do, one, uh, it might be a bit of good news to you uh, looking forward to 2021, the discussions that we've had with the work group uh, working on the CTR guy is that we recognize that PAB boost can be difficult and confusing to interpret. Uh, where do we enter that uh, in terms of phases what role does it play in terms of total dose? How am I gonna uh, add it up and so forth? So because of those complexities, we have come to a consensus that moving forward, cases diagnosed 2021, whenever a PAB uh, a boost uh, presents itself in any of your cases, ignore it. Simply ignore the PAB boost and focus on the other, other bits of information uh, that that patient uh, has for that particular site. Okay. <clears throat> um, so going back to our original case, you have 
the whole breast being irradiated, and then you have the lymph nodes being irradiated. And the reason why we treat it as separate phases is because of this. Your dose in each fraction, the fractionation changed. When you change your fractionation scheme schedule, you're talking about different phases. And then you have the, the boost. Okay. <clears throat> In this case, we had a boost of a thousand centigrade, which was external beam radiotherapy. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, let's see what else. Uh, so it was, oh, and the reason why we have that mix, that's zero one, is because that boost consisted of electrons and photons. We don't have a code for mixed modalities. So both of these are external beam radiotherapy. So the best code for that is gonna be uh, one. And because both of them are external beam radiotherapy, we can add the contribution from each to get the total dose for the boost. So this is a three phase case with the whole breast getting 5,000 and partial breast getting a thousand, and this is why we get the total of 6,000. Remember, whole breast, and this is also within the breast. We, in a case where the fractionation is different for the supraclaft, please do not add this to the total dose summary, okay? Again, when it's different fractionation, we do not add this to get the total. Head and neck case. <clears throat> Patient was treated concurrently with TOMO IMRT. Okay, so we have IMRT, but we also have TOMO, and that can be confusing if we're not familiar with the terms. This is a fractionation schedule here, or the uh, treatment summary. As I mentioned earlier, SIB, Simultaneous integrated boost. You're more likely to see this with head and neck cancer cases, but you can also see these in other sites. Uh, the other side that I've seen them a lot is in prostate cases as well. Okay. So when we talk about uh, simultaneous integrated boost, typically we talk about, we refer to them as PTV. PTV1, PTV, or PTV total dose 70, PTV665. PTV60 and PTV56. In this case, there are four distinctive volumes that were irradiated or targeted. Four volumes, that's four phases. NAG, we know that as soon as we see the X, is photon, zero two. Uh, the uniqueness about SIB is that you should expect the fraction totals for each of these to be the same. And you should also expect the start and end date to be the same as well, okay? So first off, we have taken care of the modality code, zero two. Secondly, we, I think we, uh, sorry, we saw that it was IMRT, okay? And that's zero five. Head and neck cases, we have to make sure that the patient is, is immobil immobilized, okay? So we create these masks and they are very, we, we put them in a water tank, uh, a hot water tank, and that makes it very malleable. As soon as they cool off a little, we put them on the patient and we stretch them. And then we use our fingers to follow the contour of the nose and the eyes and the mouth and the neck so that it takes that shape of that patient. And then within a, a couple of minutes, it, it dries completely and it stiffens and it, it, it retains that shape. So we use this every day. Notice that we bring the chin up. Um, it's a very complex plan. There are multiple areas that are being targeted. In head and neck patients, you, are, you should expect the lymph nodes to be targeted in addition to the primary site, okay? Because the first presentation the first thing that brings the doc, the patient to the doctor is they detect a palpable mass in the, in, in the neck. That palpable mass is not the primary site, it's lymphadenopathy, okay? 
That's the first presentation in most head and neck cases. So what are some of the rules for SIB um, or some of the uh, characteristics? All the boosts are delivered at the same time every day. Okay, so in this case, you notice that all of them have 35 fractions. And the field size is just being reduced, reduced in size as they move from one boost to the other or from one PTB to the other. And this is another schematic uh, on, on, the, on the boost. Okay? The highest dose is delivered to the smallest volume. The smallest dose is delivered to the largest volume. You're always going to boost your primary site. And then uh, regional dose might get different, different dose range as it is in this case. Okay? Some areas may be more uh, uh, risky areas. So they might, they might get more and so forth. So in this case, this patient had four PTVs. That's four phases. Okay? Remember that we're limited to capturing three phases only in the abstract. But nevertheless, you should still put in the total number of faces here. There were four faces, so make sure you include that in the abstract. As far as which faces you're gonna capture, remember the rule that when we have SIB, phase one is always going to be the highest dose phase, which was the PTB70. And then you just go in that numerical order, PTB70, PTB66, and 60, okay? Unfortunately, one phase is going to be left out Okay, we understand that, but make sure that you capture that there and make sure that you provide the details of the fourth phase in the notepad as well. Don't just, don't just discard that information. Even though it's not captured in, in, in the radiation therapy section of the abstract, do put that information in, 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 the, in the notepad as well. Wilson, yes. Before you, before you move on to scenario A, we have a question. Okay. They couldn't hear. So when they when they are mixed modalities, we should code as external beam photon or external beam NOS. Um, that depends. I mean, if if you're talking about mixed modalities, I mean, it, it could potentially be external beam and brachytherapy. So what do they mean? What are the mixed modalities that they have in mind? Did they, did they include that? No, they did not. No, okay, so it depends. I mean, if you're talking about mixed modalities and what you have in mind is electrons and photons. So in, in that particular scenario, I will code it to zero one, okay? But if you're talking about external beam radiotherapy and brachytherapy, that's a totally different scenario. So it, it really is case specific. Okay, prostate case. Uh, this one this one also was submitted to me. Uh, the, the reason why I selected this is because there is a change in the planning technique but it's not that easy to uh, decipher, to determine, okay? Let's look at the, and, and this clearly comes from the radiation oncology database, okay? There's a screen capture here. So one side was the pelvis and the prostate, okay? 25 fractions. I see 25 and I see 4,500, and I know that it is 180 centigrade. So again, this is external beam radiotherapy. And the technique was VMAT, okay? We know VMAT, volumetric modulated art therapy, rotational therapy at minimum. I always say this, at minimum, you should consider IMRT. And I'll explain why I say that right here. Now, cone down, you know it's a boost, so it's a much smaller volume. And usually it's only a few fractions, but notice here, okay? 
this is going to take me back to the distinction I make between conventional fractionation and hypo fractionation. Phase one is an example of conventional fractionation. Look at the dose per fraction, 180 centigrade per fraction. If you review the slides from this morning, in, in a couple of places, I define what conventional fractionation is, and that's dose per fraction in the range of 180 to 200 centigrade per fraction. And the number of fraction is, I mentioned that it was prolonged, you know, it could be 26, it could be 30, it could be 35 fractions. You know, we're talking about six to 10 weeks plus, that's conventional fractionation. On the other hand, hyperfractionation, phase two is hyperfractionation. You should expect to see only a handful of fractions. In this case, only three. And very large fraction size, okay? Huge. This patient is being irradiated to 650 centigrade in three fractions for a total of 1950. Notice the difference, 180 to 650. This is conventional, this is hypo. It goes along with the number of fractions. A few fractions, very large fraction size. Small fraction size, a large number of sessions or fractions, okay? So why do I make that distinction? When I see this, the very first thing that I suspect that crosses my mind as, as far as planning technique is, this looks very much like SBRT. And we have a separate code for that, okay? Notice here, the technique, it tells you that is VMAT, and we know VMAT IMRT, right? But it's also telling me SBRT, it's also telling me SRS, which is overkill, but, so when you have this, when you know IMRT, but you also have SBRT, put them together. As soon as you see SBRT, you ask yourself, wait a minute, let me confirm this. Let me look at the fraction sizes and the number of fractions. If it is, as Wilson described, hyperfractionated, then I am comfortable then coding it to 06 for SBRT. If it is conventional fractionation and I see VMAT, then I am comfortable coding this phase to IMRT. And I know that was a handful there or a mouthful, I should say. Um, so we clearly do have two phases, okay? Two volumes. You know that the cone down is going to be a much smaller volume. So when you when you reduce your volume size, you're talking about a different phase. So clearly two phases. Okay. Phase one, it did specify that the lymphatics are in, in the radiated field. It is an external beam. Uh, it's a linear accelerator that was used and VMAT IMRT. Okay. Second one, it mentioned that it was SBRT and we confirmed by looking at the hyperfractionation that's, that was used. So I am comfortable coding it to 06. And because in both phases, the prostate was irradiated, we can safely add the dose from each of the phases to get your total dose. IORT breast IORT. I gave you a slide this morning and I made the claim that if the equipment that you use is in that slide, you should be able to code a hundred percent of your IORT cases correctly. I stick by that claim. Let me show you an example here. So this patient underwent a lumpectomy and IORT. This is the standard. The patient, as soon as the patient has had the lumpectomy procedure completed, the surgeon steps aside and the radiation oncologist steps in to do his or, his or her IRT procedure while the patient's still in the, in the OR table, okay? <clears throat> and it tells us here that the, the IRT 
equipment that was used was a Zeiss Intrabeam, okay? and the total dose is 20 grays. Now, when you get the total dose given to you, it's not clear exactly what is meant until we understand the equipment that's used. It's hard to interpret this. I mean, did they do a conversion from a brachytherapy procedure? Or is that the unit that is used for this equipment? Well, let me introduce you to the Zeiss Intrabeam equipment, okay? This portion is inserted into the lumpectomy cavity, okay? But the unit works very much like a LINAC, like a linear accelerator, external beam radiotherapy. And the energy that is generated is in the forms of photons. The biggest difference between your conventional linear accelerator and this is in the energy range. When you see 6NV, it's telling you that the energy of that beam is 6 million voltage, okay? Mega voltage, 6 million voltage. In this case of the Zeiss intrabeam, the energy range is in the kilo voltage, which is low energy photons. Okay, so a couple of very important distinctions here. First of all, this is still external beam radiotherapy and it is delivering photon therapy. So there goes your modality code, zero two, out of the way, okay? Anytime you see the Zeiss interbeam, it looks different, it looks odd. It is still external beam radiotherapy with photon zero two. This is another machine that works very much the same way that the Zeiss Interbeam works, meaning that it is generating low energy KV photons. So whether your facility uses the soft accent or the Zeiss Interbeam, code them the same way. Zero two for the modality code and <clears throat> The planning technique is going to be zero two. Zero two is low energy photons. Remember the range for these uh, machines is in the, typically in about 50 kV. That's what's prescribed for the boost on these patients, 50 kV. That's very low energy. As an example, if you have ever gotten a chest X-ray that machine is usually in the range of 90 to 100 kV to generate a chest X-ray. So this machine is even a lower kV range. The, the, the difference is that we, because it's inserted into the lumpectomy cavity, it doesn't have to travel very far. So even though it's very low kV, the biological effect is very high. It simulates brachytherapy procedures, okay? And that's why they call it electronic brachytherapy. So, but I think that's confusing for us because as soon as we see the term brachytherapy in a name, we think of the brachytherapy codes, not with this, not with this equipment, no. It's still external beam radiotherapy, it's still photon, and we have a planning technique of zero two for that. So, and the dose was 20 grays, so 2000 centigrade, and that was the total dose for this one. And the other point that I made earlier this morning was that uh, when you do IRT, you are irradiating the partial breast, uh, smaller volumes, so the lymph nodes are not in the irradiated field. A liver case, um, you might see these uh, abbreviation S-I-R-T or T-A-R-E, selective internal radiation therapy or uh, similarly or synonymously transarterial radioembolization. 
and uh, you're most likely to see this for the treatment of a primary liver cancer, okay, primary liver cancer. <clears throat> and the radioactive source that is used is yttrium 90, okay, it's a radioactive source. And how is that delivered? First of all, there are two major um, vehicles for delivering this, uh, this, uh, this type of radiation or, or yeah, radiation into the patient. Uh, we can use resin seeds or spheres, actually they're spheres or glass spheres or beads. When this is inserted vascularly in, into the liver, we're talking about millions of these spheres, millions of them that are injected into the vasculature to treat these uh, uh, liver primaries. And these are the uh, commercial names for these. Okay? The, you're more likely to see the serous sphere or the thorough sphere. They are implanted permanently into the patient because at some point uh, the radiation will have dissipated and it's not going to cause any 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 damage. It's not going to have any any additional effect. And notice the how how deeply it penetrates. Very very shallow, two point five millimeters. Okay. So it, it it does not irradiate adjacent structures or, or or organs at risk within in the vicinity of the liver. It's very very localized uh, therapy. And this is just a picture of the therosphere and the serospheres. And again, these are injected vascularly into the liver in the millions. <clears throat> and so it is a type of radioisotope, but there's no, there's no specific, no more specific code than code 13 for these cases, okay? Uh, when you see these of so the yttrium 90 being used, immediately think of 13 radio, radioactive isotopes, okay, or just radioisotopes. Clearly the liver is your target here. So 56 is pretty clear and it's very localized. Remember, it only penetrates about two millimeters. So it's not targeting the uh, adjacent lymphatics at all. And there is no unit, there is no centigrade unit for, for these procedures, for these radioisotopes. So you're gonna be using the codes with the eight at the end. Same thing for the total dose. And these are some questions that have also appeared and I know I have addressed, I, I addressed the first one. Any, anytime you see on fast electrons uh, or on fast technique, two things, one of them is, it's associated with boost to the breast. Number two, in, 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 in most cases, and number two is just electron therapy, electron boost. So you see on fast, think electrons, think zero four, okay? Uh, dose painting. I have seen this being mentioned in the treatment summary, okay? Dose painting is another way of referring to IMRT, okay? IMRT. Another term that I, I neglected to mention earlier on uh, uh, associated with IMRT is inverse planning. If you see inverse planning, they are talking about the IMRT planning technique. Field in field, I covered that already. That was brought up in one of the questions. And before that question came up, I already had this as a question that I was going to discuss, but um, that was already covered. Another one, I, I, if, if you happen to see the FFF uh, technique, firstly, when you see it, skip it. It has nothing to do with code, it's just another technical term in radiation oncology, radiation therapy. It's what it stands for is flattening filter free, okay? And uh, it's just the physics of the linear accelerator. So I don't want to confuse you. So I'm gonna end that by just telling you that when you see that flattening filter free technique, it has not, nothing to do with the codes that we use from the store manual. So ignore that. And with that, 
I've come to the end of my presentation and these are the same uh, resources that you saw this morning. Questions? Wilson, we don't have any questions right now. Um, we have a few comments. Excellent presentation. So thank you very, very much. <clears throat> Appreciate your expertise and your time with us. Every time I listen to you, I learn something. Very good. Very good. Well, if, if questions do come up later on, uh, as, as I mentioned to, to Rhonda, um, you know, ju just collect them and email them to me and I'll be more than happy to, to respond so that everyone can benefit from them. Okay, I do have one quick question. Do you have a second or sure. two? At the central registry, I see liver cases where the text is describes Y90 treatment, but it is coded to stronium 90. Can you please describe the difference between Y90 and stronium 90? Yeah, uh, in terms of coding, think of them the same. I will code that to radioactive isotopes, NOS. Okay. Yeah. Um, oppor opportune for glioblastoma, non-invasive skull cap. Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually Optune. Optune, okay. Yeah. Um, FM, is it coded to other therapy or radiation? Definitely not radiation. It's not, it's not radiation at all. So no, no radiation. Okay. That's all I have. <laughs> so thank you so much again, Wilson. You're more than welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you. you. All Thank right. You. Enjoy, everyone. Be safe. Awesome. Okay. For those still on, we are going to um, draw for today's Amazon e gift card. It will be emailed to you. Um, just a little housekeeping. Um, the uh, presentations from this morning and this afternoon are recorded and be available to everybody um, who has registered for this conference. So let me share my screen for the drawing. Who's ready? Ready? Here we go. Here we go. Jenny Rios will be emailing you your e-gift Amazon card to the email address you provided on the registration. Thank you again, everybody. Rhonda, do you have any final? Yeah, just thank you. It seems like today was a very smooth and amazing first day. So thank you everybody for your participation. Tomorrow you will be using the same link that you use for today's session. Um, all of our sessions for the morning are 9 a.m. All of our sessions for the afternoon is 2 p.m., of course, Eastern time. And thank you so, 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 so much. Um, if you have any questions or comments or you have some technical glitches, please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us. Um, the easiest way to get us is to email Gatra Inc, I -N -C, at gmail.com. That's all I have, but thank you. Thank you, everybody.